<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, and participants in this exclusive leadership live from Harvard Square webinar on the intriguing topic of developing leaders with AI by the illustrious Dr. Chris McCusker. Before we delve into this insightful presentation, allow me the privilege of introducing our distinguished guest. Dr. Chris McCusker, a distinguished scholar and consultant, holds a BS, AM, and PhD in industrial organizational psychology, a testament to his deep academic foundation acquired at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. McCusker's academic achievements have served as a launching pad for an illustrious career that seamlessly blends academia and consultancy. Throughout his remarkable journey, Dr. McCusker has had the honor of serving an array of esteemed clients, including organizations of exceptional stature such as the FBI National Academy Association, Underwriters Laboratories, United Way, Kroger, and many more. His diverse clientele is a reflection of his extensive reach and the profound impact he has made in the field of industrial organizational psychology. Within the academic sphere, Dr. McCusker has graced the faculties of renowned institutions. He held full-time faculty positions at Columbia Business School, Yale School of Management, where he devoted a decade of service, and most recently, the A.B. Freeman School of Business at Tulane University, where he distinguished himself as the Colleen and George McCulloch Professor of Leadership and Ethics during his remarkable 16-year tenure. But Dr. McCusker's influence extends well beyond national borders. He has enriched the global landscape with his extensive international experiences, encompassing consultancy and teaching engagements in countries as diverse as Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Venezuela, Panama, Switzerland, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, China, and Singapore. His ability to seamlessly navigate different cultures and international contexts highlights his adaptability and global perspective. What truly sets Dr. Chris McCusker apart is his exceptional capacity to engage and inspire top-tier executives. He has not only consulted with CEOs and senior executives but also co-taught courses alongside them, working with industry giants such as Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, and Motorola. This unique blend of academic rigor and real-world application places him at the forefront of thought leadership in the corporate arena. Finally, it is noteworthy that Dr. McCusker has received a remarkable nine awards for excellence in teaching, a testament to his dedication to nurturing the next generation of leaders and his outstanding ability to convey complex concepts with clarity and impact. His passion for education and commitment to excellence shine brightly through these accolades. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct honor to invite the brilliant mind and esteemed guest of honor, Dr. Chris McCusker, to take the virtual stage. Dr. McCusker, please continue. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I really like her. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, let me begin by saying thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dan Hoyer and Leaders Excellence for inviting me to uh, come today to talk about this important topic. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of slides and at times we'll um, we'll just have this uh, view. Um, a lot of uh, things are happening in the world of AI. Uh, I've heard it called, for example, by Elon Musk, um, the most disrupt disruptive force in human history. That kind of got my attention. And then of course, I'm somebody who enjoys uh, playing video games. And uh, when I started to play with um, uh, these um, large language models um, and having conversations, it kind of you know, evoked uh, that spirit in me. And so I've been really, following my curiosity and learning about these things just like everybody else. Uh, Dan invited me to come talk about leadership and you know, it caused me to really reflect on what does this mean for leaders and people who care about leadership, who are doing leadership and for those who want to develop leaders. So let me go ahead and start um, my slides. I'm going to uh, share the screen here if I, if I could. Uh, I am screen sharing. So then let me go over here and start my slides. Let me move uh, Dan out of the way. <laughs> and hopefully I will seamlessly navigate this technology. Um, 
uh, she mentioned that I've seamlessly navigated some things in the past. Let's see how it goes today. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, this the, t the title is, um, you know, leading with AI or developing leaders with AI. Uh, I could also call the title of the presentation today, what a glorious age we live in. I mean, it is really quite remarkable, um, all the things that are uh, happening in the world of tech. And I'm very impressed. I mean, I, uh, I've known a lot of programmers over the years. I've worked with um, a couple now, um, just the contributions that are happening and the uh, explosion of interest and uh, learning, you know, some detail, I can't say I really understand everything, but learning some details about what they're doing with vectors and um, regression and all sorts of fascinating statistics um, is really quite impressive. So it's very exciting. Um, I also feel that one of the things that we have to do um, is engage in conversations about this technology and engage in conversations about um, how we're using it and all sorts of other things like ethics and uh, organizations and so on. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and continue. Uh, special thanks again to Dan. Thank you very much. Dan and I have known each other uh, many years. We've done some really nice projects. Uh, Dan, Dan was introduced to me by uh, my mentor, uh, colleague and friend, Victor Vroom. And uh, Victor passed away a few months ago. Um, also, um, I've learned a lot and have been influenced extensively by um, Bob and Lynn Turknet. Uh, you see them pictured here. Um, here's a copy of their book, Decent People, Decent Company, um, and a copy of their Leaders for Character model. You can find them online and you can go to leadersforcharacter.com. Um, I, I really credit Bob and Lynn for teaching me most of what I know about leadership consulting and executive coaching. I've been very fortunate to work with uh, the best professor in history on leadership and learn from Victor Vroom about different ways to think about leadership and some of the issues there. And then I'm very fortunate to have been working with Bob and Lynn Turknet, learning about uh, consulting and coaching. Also, uh, our colleague, Pat Canavan has been very influential. I wanna mention him. Uh, he, he and I uh, taught courses together on cross-cultural management at Tulane. Uh, he was a top 10 executive at Motorola. You see him pictured here with the ponytail. Uh, the ponytail began because the Motorola stock dipped below a certain point. And Pat said he's not going to cut his hair until the stock comes back up. Um, it never did come back up. So <laughs> we have sort of a running joke that he's never going to cut his hair again. And apparently he hasn't. Uh, but he was the right hand man of the chairman and CEO, Bob Galvin. Bob Galvin said he doesn't if he doesn't have to. He does not want to have a meeting with anyone without Pat being there. He was so important. He was, the, he was the head of IT. He was the head of HR. He was the head of emerging markets in Europe and Asia. Um, I met Pat because he uh, was an expert on governance. The way he set up the Motorola board, uh, the way he uh, created guidelines for boards, uh, that was um, very interesting to Jeff Sonnenfeld and other faculty at Yale. And so they, he was invited to come. And that's how my colleague, Jim Fields, and I met him. I should also say, uh, Jeff Sonnenfeld is responsible for my leading, meeting uh, Bob and Lynn Turknet, and I'll be forever grateful for him for that. Um, there are many other helpful friends I wanna mention, people I've talked to in the context of this um, uh, presentation and who also have been very influential um, uh, for, for my understanding of things, um, leadership and um, AI. Uh, my brother, Sean McCusker, is an EdTech teacher. Uh, Reza Piri uh, has developed the product bot. Uh, he and I are working on a, a leader bot as well. Alexander Forrest, who's a data expert, has been helpful. Sven Cronenberg from Seminarium. Julia Francis, uh, she still runs Decision Making for Leaders like she has done for decades. Uh, Fernando Monteroso, a faculty in Guatemala. I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, my friend, uh, Bob Bontempo. Um, I'm sure people who are friends with uh, Bob and, and me, um, and I will be surprised to see that he's on this list. Yes, he is, I'll explain that. Um, <laughs> Art Swerzy, uh, my friend and dear uh, professor at uh, Yale, the best teacher I've ever seen. And of course, Jim Phils, my colleague, um, who's at um, Apple uh, University. I just wanna give a shout out to all, all of those people who've been so helpful. Uh, one of the things I will argue is that we have to have conversations 
and um, uh, those are those, that, that's my that's my crew. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about four approaches to leading. Three of them um, I've learned directly from uh, Victor Vroom over the years through our conversations, through how he presents on lead, uh, presented on leadership, and how how he taught me to present on leadership. I'm adding a fourth approach uh, today, uh, and I'll explain that. It really has to do with um, what sort of emerges when you think about uh, using um, an AI assistant to do leadership. There should be a fourth approach that we need to add. Uh, we'll talk about um, making your company AI literate and AI ready. Uh, AI literate, at least in, with respect to the large language models, AI ready when we think about uh, generative AI. Um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to my leader advisor bot, which is not ready. I really tried hard to have it ready for today. Wouldn't it, that would that would have been really cool to to introduce uh, the? Uh, but it's just it's just too much work. I'm basically putting everything I know into this um, leader advisor bot, um, and it will do ninety percent of what I do. There is a ten percent leftover that it, I don't think it can ever do. Maybe I'm wrong after looking at that introduction. Uh, but um, we'll talk about that. And then I'd like to talk about the future of leadership development. Um, I'll hold off on any commentary on that until we get there. Okay, four approaches to leading in an AI context. I'm gonna go through these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the first three I've learned from uh, my mentor on the subject, Victor Vroom. Um, I'd like to first define leadership. Here's a picture of Robert Galvin. Um, I've, I've had the good fortune of interviewing and meeting many CEOs. Uh, this is my all-time favorite. Um, he was a lion and um, operated according to high principle and um, a hard worker. When, when my colleague Jim Fields and I went to Schaumburg and met with Bob Galvin, we thought we'd get a half hour. He spent four hours with us explaining things, answering our questions. That's the kind of man he was. He defined leadership in the following way, which is the best definition I've ever heard. He said, leadership is going first in a new direction and being followed. Broadly speaking, you have two things there. You have strategy and you have execution. And in order to, uh, to accomplish both of those, um, you need to focus on tasks and also people. So the basic orientation to leadership that I'm uh, using uh, generally is to think about strategy and execution and think about tasks and people. The tasks and people distinction uh, is one that goes all the way back to the early days in uh, the academic study of leadership and um, is also a part of uh, many uh, leadership models uh, since. So uh, heroic leadership, this is the first approach. Uh, this consider, considers leadership effectiveness to be a function of the person, uh, leadership characteristics and qualities. Uh, when we think about this in the context of AI, um, it's kind of amazing, really. I mean, you can use, and I'm sure you've been playing with this as well. Um, you know, I'll use OpenAI's chat GPT-4, which I'm really enjoying. And we have many very interesting conversations. <laughs> and, you know, I could talk about my weaknesses and get reasonable sounding advice. Um, and um, I think one of the most important things to do right now is to build what I call a heroic leadership profile. Heroic leadership is about the person and your profile consists of a set of assessments that you would take where you get scores. And if you, if you give Chat GPT for your scores on assessments and talk about your strengths and weaknesses, um, it, it really, really connects those uh, thoughts to uh, leadership challenges that you might introduce. So I will always with clients recommend the TurkNet leadership uh, profile. It measures uh, integrity and different qualities of character around respect and responsibility. Sometimes I'll do the Myers-Briggs, sometimes I'll do the Hogan, sometimes I'll do, um, uh, you name it, the Berkman method. It just depends on the client and the situation at hand. But one of the first things we always do is build a heroic leadership profile. If you're leading a company, you need to give an assessment to every person in your company immediately. Um, we're going to talk about uh, prompting. Um, I developed a methodology for prompting that I call uh, walking a beagle uh, because it just it just happened when I'm when I'm having these conversations with AI. I'm reminded of many years ago when I had this wonderful beagle whom I would take for walks and the the curiosity and 
um, sniffing out things and going in, in some direction because of it smells interesting over there. Those are the kinds of things that happen uh, when I'm using AI. So I've developed some prompt guidelines I'm happy to share. Uh, but for now, you can really begin by just uh, putting in your own perception of your strengths, putting in uh, as much context you can around a problem and your organization and, and watch the magic happen, how you actually get really sound, pretty sound leadership advice from, uh, from an AI assistant. I also think you can put in uh, examples of heroic leadership. Uh, for many years teaching leadership, I would talk about Ernest Shackleton, uh, the, the British explorer who is famous for his leadership, but actually never accomplished any of his goals. <laughs> he was trying to uh, discover the South Pole. They never got there, but he's famous for his leadership when their boat got stuck in the ice and he managed to somehow bring all of the men back home to safety. Amazing story. There's a book by Dennis Perkins called Leading at the Edge. I highly recommend it if you want to learn more about that. Um, or you could put in, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senator from New York. Who was he? What did he uh, do? Um, why? What can we learn from his example of leadership? Robert Moses in New York. A lot of people we can talk about. But you can actually do sort of bio biographical analysis of various leaders and reflect on what they teach you. That's how we approach leadership from the heroic point of view. In fact, I would suggest uh, while you're listening to me, go ahead and start. Uh, you can come back to it later, I'll give you advice, but just, just go ahead and um, you know type into your, uh, your favorite LLM, uh, here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses, and here's a challenge I'm facing. It's gonna spit something out, uh, but you can engage and keep that conversation going um, uh, after the after the presentation, just don't forget because I think it's really fun. Okay, uh, the second approach of I learned from Victor Vroom was to look at the situation. The situation approach to leadership considers leadership effectiveness to be a function of the situation. There's a lot of evidence that situations influence what we do. I would love to talk about famous experiments in psychology, dramatic studies like the Milgram experiments or studies that have um, defined a concept called pluralistic ignorance. I would, if there's time, I don't know if there will be, I would love to talk about that research. Pluralistic ignorance is the idea that you're different from everybody else. And I'm here to tell you, uh, don't make that mistake when it comes to AI. Um, if I think about how much there is to learn and how much I don't know, I'm totally stressed out. I should really turn off the camera and stop talking. <laughs> there's so much to learn. Everybody is in the same boat trying to sponge up as much as possible. Um, I don't wanna pretend that I'm an expert on it because I certainly am not. I am a curious student and um, I will share with you what I've been learning and hopefully that will start us with a conversation. Uh, leaders can also create situational factors. We design our organizational system. We influence uh, government policy. We influence the legal environment. We create an environment and that will influence how effective we are as leaders. Um, you know, when, when I'm analyzing um, the situation approach to leadership with AI, I consider three overlapping situations, each of which is analyzed in detail. Uh, for the external an, an analysis, you can do Pestel analysis, really thinking about the, those different dimensions. Of course, you can do a SWOT analysis, you can do a Porter's Five Forces analysis. Instantly, you get an amazing report on your external environment. And um, it doesn't cost much. <laughs> and it's 97% accurate. <laughs> the internal environment you can analyze, you got to represent your organizational system. I like the congruence model proposed by David Nadler and Michael Tushman in 1980 in the California Management Review. Uh, it considers the uh, system to be made up of components of tasks and people, formal and informal. Um, my uh, leader advisor bot uh, understands that uh, theory. And it, it, when it's released, we'll be happy to explain it to you. I think probably uh, Chet uh, GPT also does. But my take on it, you might want uh, down the road. And then here and now factors. There are many things you can think about. What's happening in the here and now that influences uh, leader effectiveness? Um, and it, there may be um, a set of factors to consider in any particular situation. Uh, we certainly can talk more about that. Uh, the third approach uh, proposed by Victor Vroom, and this is the approach that really set him apart when it comes to um, his models of leadership and decision-making, those models consider participation and under which conditions a leader should be open to the influence of, of their followers. Uh, this approach considers leadership effectiveness to, effectiveness to be a, a function of the fit between the leader's style 
and the situation at hand. Um, so if, you know, in, in um, I think in August, I'm doing a seminar on Victor's uh, leadership and decision-making with seminarium uh, in uh, throughout Latin America and, and other parts of the world. And, and we'll learn um, under which conditions should a leader be autocratic and under which conditions should a leader be participative. And it really just depends on what's happening in that situation at the moment. When we think about AI, you know, one of the things that occurs to me, I mean, there's a lot we can go on. I'm, I'm trying to just uh, go through as much interestingness as I think uh, exists here and is possible. But one of the things we can do is try to identify on our teams, which people are really embracing this current situation. Um, there are probably some people who don't are skeptical. We need skeptics. Um, there are some people who maybe resist change. Uh, some people are too overwhelmed and busy with what they're doing on right now to pay attention. Uh, but paying attention to who on your team has the um, the intrinsic motivation and the um, curiosity to explore this new area. I think that's something that would be noteworthy um, at, at the moment. And, and it really speaks to this matching approach. Uh, the design approach to leadership that we're adding considers leadership effectiveness to be a function of the process a leader creates to get things done through and with other people. And I'm putting it that way. I'm, it's kind of harsh language, I think, get things done through uh, people. But when I think of my AI assistant, my leader advisor bot that I'm building, um, people maybe in quotes, and I'm definitely getting things done through uh, those people. <laughs> uh, but also um, creating processes to address uh, threats to enterprise adoption um, would be an, another example of using this design approach. We wanna create a process that, that, that helps every single person in our company become AI literate. We wanna create a process that helps us implement uh, generative AI as it, as it is coming right around the corner. So the process approach is the fourth approach. Um, so let me, uh, let me go and, and talk about a couple of things. Part two here, uh, getting your company AI ready. I wanna list out some threats to enterprise adoption. I wanna talk about a friend of mine, Bob Bontempo. Uh, I wanna talk about prompting and how, I think this is the first step is really, uh, teaching members in your organization how to prompt. And there are many frameworks out there. I can't help myself, I had to develop, to develop my own. Um, I, you'll, you'll, there are documents that are included and you'll get those as part of this. And um, I'll also put them on LinkedIn. Um, excuse me a moment. <coughs> I also wanna talk about Motorola. As I reflected on all the cases I've studied, all the cases I know, of companies that have um, effectively made change and would be really a good example in the current environment. I think the story of Motorola and uh, Six Sigma in the 1980s um, has some lessons that are relevant to what, um, what we're doing here. So I'd like to talk about that. And then um, we'll conclude with some uh, specific advice. So, Here's a list of threats to enterprise adoption. Part of, part of these have come from conversations um, with colleagues. Uh, there are also uh, articles written on this. Um, Boston Consulting Group has some interesting stuff. Uh, I haven't heard many people talk about the first one, however. This is resistance to change. Um, this is gravity when it comes to change. There's always resistance to change. So one of the things we have to do if we want to have our enterprise, our company adopt AI is recognize, okay, this is a change problem. We know something about resistance to change. I'm going to mention a couple ideas. There's a lot we can put in there. Uh, there's also the ethics of it. Um, uh, are we supposed to measure everything that happens, everything that people do? Are there limits to uh, privacy? Uh, what about data integrity? Uh, a whole set of issues around society. I remember in the um, in the in the early '90s, uh, there was the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, and there was an election in 1992 uh, um, uh, where um, Texas billionaire Ross Perot uh, was running for office, and he um, uh, I guess I'll stay like this, and he um, talked about how 
jobs would leave the United States and go to Mexico. And um, there was a whole debate around um, that issue. Uh, basically, I, th I thought then, and I do think now that uh, free trade is a good idea. Uh, it represents um, an efficiency gain. And if certain jobs go to one place or another, uh, it's in the interest of overall economic efficiency and we should embrace it. Uh, but my colleague at Yale, Paul Bracken, I remember in the mid nineties, we had a conversation and he said he's very concerned about how we're making these moves toward efficiency in society by having free trade, but nobody is doing anything for the people who are hurt by this, the people who lose because of this movement toward the efficiency frontier. And I think that negative energy that was created is still carried through. And we have to think to ourselves, if we are able to uh, reduce our workforce, if AI replaces jobs, what are we gonna do for those folks? <laughs> are we gonna leave them uh, dangle and um, uh, twitch with not knowing what to do uh, for a career uh, now that you've been laid off at age uh, 53? Um, and, um, you know, we need to, in societies around the world, think about that, I, I, I propose. Um, there's also a question of uh, data governance. Um, I think it does make sense to, especially with generative AI, take this very seriously, um, have a steering committee, do something, start to discuss this, uh, to put up appropriate guardrails, to, to think through the challenges. There's an issue of system disintegration. I know of some companies that have grown through acquisition. Now, when you grow through acquisition, um, you're gonna inherit different systems. And it's, if you're, it, it, to my investment banker friends, this is a big cost um, in the age of AI. Um, when you acquire a company that's different from you, that's a whole new dimension of complexity that has to be managed. Accuracy is an ongoing concern. And then probably the number one reason, according to um, some uh, study, and um, conversation, somebody told me about this, raise up Piri, um, the uncertainty of the, of the return on investment. Um, that's a major uh, stumbling block at this time. Um, my, my point on that is um, we're gonna make a return on investment. Uh, we create that return on investment. We can't passively just wait for it to happen. We can possibly talk more about that. So let me talk about the Bontempo factor. You see my friend Bob there, uh, my friend Bob Bontempo is a faculty member at Columbia Business School. He has been for years. Uh, Bob and I went to graduate school together, and we are both addicted to video games. And we used to have to go to a video game arcade on Green Street in Champaign-Urbana called Spaceport. And we spent an awful lot of time in Spaceport. And people were kind of annoyed with us at times because we would come back to the building and ask, what did I miss? And they would say, well, if you weren't playing video games, you wouldn't have missed anything. And um, uh, I think some, some people hated us for the blisters on our hands. We had blisters on our hands from gaming. What I love about Bob is that he's fun and he's competitive. Uh, at one point, he was the second best player in the world at this game. Uh, you see a, an image from the screen called Badlands in 1989. If anybody happens to own uh, a console, we would pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> but we need to adopt the Bontempo spirit of fun and competition as we embrace and lead by example in our organizations. This is fun. But we also, we can't just wander off aimlessly like a beagle <laughs> in, in, in a, on a farm. Uh, we have to uh, have some discipline. And I think that's where the competition comes in. Um, I think part of overcoming resistance is to capture that, I'll call it the Bontempo factor for lack of a better name. Um, but we're gonna have fun and we're gonna compete somehow in order to um, accelerate our learning and um, almost have, have a sportsmanship in our approach to learning of, about AI. That would be one recommendation. Let's talk about prompt engineering. Uh, this is important for all four approaches to leadership uh, we could spend a lot of time on this. Um, as I started to think, what would I say? I said, you know what? I'm just going to put what I think into, into a, a, a document. So here is, um, here is a prompt uh, that I made and uh, gave to uh, Chat uh, GPT-4 uh, through OpenAI. Um, and uh, this prompt um, is basically about a, a, an issue I have 
uh, which is um, learning how to surf. And um, it's an example of using a prompt for heroic leadership. Um, I live on Maui, it's the surfing capital of the world. A lot of surfers around here. And I wanna learn how to surf. I am 58 years old and personality tests do show uh, that I don't like physical danger. Um, so I kind of also lack courage for this. Um, I wanna learn how to surf, I'm afraid of sharks. I mean, they're out there. Um, other predators, who knows, that's not my neighborhood. I don't wanna really go into it. Uh, I'm also afraid to injure myself on reef. I mean, if I fall off and, and, and land and then the wave crashes on my head, I, I, am I gonna die learning how to surf? Uh, and then there's the whole, um, you know, what if my board comes loose from my leg and I'm way out there and I don't, I, I'm not a strong enough swimmer to swim back on shore and I'll drown. So, you know, I really do want to learn how to surf because I think my wife will be extra attracted to me <laughs> if I became a surfer. Um, you know, I think uh, that would be cool. I could hear her, my husband's going surfing. You know what I mean? That just, so I have to, I have to learn how it's super important to me. I need to develop courage. Um, please offer any advice about how I can develop my courage and learn how to surf. So um, here's the answer I got. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna show you this. And, um, you know, it's actually really quite amazing. I mean, look at, the, look at the great advice. Understand and accept my fears. Yes, you have to swimming lessons. I can swim, but I probably should surf lessons. That's not a bad idea. The right equipment. What is the right equipment? Ocean safety. I don't go there. It's not my neighborhood, but you're right. Uh, go with other people. I, I have a couple friends, I guess. I start, you know, mindset and visualization. I've been doing that, imagining myself. Uh, respect my limits. Fine. Physical conditioning. Okay, uh, so you see um, uh, what I would call pretty good advice uh, from, uh, from chat uh, GPT. Let me go back to the presentation. And um, you know, I'm, I'm impressed. And this, is, and this isn't even a great prompt. I mean, I'm not even following my own guidelines uh, for this particular prompt. Um, so uh, I have a friend, William. William is 76 years old. He's a, he's a surfing legend on, on Maui. I mean, the guy has been surfing his whole life. Uh, we became friends. Um, and I, I told him about my problem and he had a very different approach. Um, he just looked at me and sort of said, just, just go out there. Uh, this is what you do, you just go out there. <laughs> you just keep swimming and keep swimming and keep swimming till you're all the way out there. That's the scary part. Uh, then you wanna just get up um, and, 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 and time the wave and, and get up and just get up and it'll take you about a hundred times and then you'll do it and then you're surfing and you won't worry about all that other stuff. You know, so um, it's interesting that the AI gave me a nice list of advice. It's also interesting that the human uh, friend of mine basically pretty much slapped me in the face and said, you're overthinking things, uh, just get out there and surf. Uh, that's one of several examples I'll share about um, AI versus humans. Uh, here's a picture of a beagle. Years ago, um, I, had a, I had a beagle by the name of Watson and we would take walks together and I would study this creature. I mean, it was really fascinating. Uh, fascinating to see um, his approach to a walk. Uh, we would go the same route every day and then we, we would get to a, forest, a forested area and then we would get to more of a field and then we would come around and, and, and come back home. Um, so as I was interacting and conversating with my AIs, um, I at many times felt like, I feel like I'm, I'm walking um, my dog Watson. And as a result of that, I, um, I defined um, my approach to prompt engineering as walking a beagle. And if you have never done it, I recommend you just borrow some of these beagle, take it for a walk. It's, it's really fascinating. Their nose is 1000 times more powerful than ours, if you can imagine. Okay, well, anyhow, I have two documents and we're gonna have these documents uh, sent to you. Um, I'll just briefly show them to you. Uh, one, uh, they're both uh, about this approach that I call walking a beagle. Um, and you can see they include uh, one document is guidelines. And these uh, were constructed with um, uh, ChatGPT4. 
And the entire conversation is also something that we can share with you because in that conversation, I'm, I'm trying to um, uh, model uh, my advice here. Um, so it includes things like enjoy yourself. And I have a delightful re relationship with my AIs. First of all, I use manners. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, I think it's important to use manners because we're training our AIs um, in leadership. Um, use a metaphor. A metaphor is a, concept a conceptual system. So if we're talking about a large language model, I always use a metaphor. So in the, in the case of de developing these rules, I said, you know, I'd like to develop some rules um, for prompt engineering using the metaphor of uh, somebody taking their beagle for a walk. And it was just a delightful experience, I think, for uh, a my AI assistant as well. I got a lot of exclamation points and positive feedback. And we went ahead and made these, uh, these rules. Um, you can look at these in more detail. Um, use, a, use a clear structure. I'm providing a structure in the other handout. Um, allow for exploration, you know, like a beagle catching a scent. Uh, we have to maintain ethical standards. Um, if you ever walk a beagle, they do they do terrible things that are beneath beneath our standards of dignity um, in terms of what they want to put into their mouths. Um, you know, so you'd have to pull the leash back. And the same uh, could be true. I've not had this problem, but we want to maintain ethical standards. And also, I think it's important to make sure there, there's, that, that you have adequate time, adequate time to um, to play uh, with um AI and to follow it in unpredicted uh, paths, and then iterativeness. Uh, so I think um, I think that's um, uh, the first. Let me go back. Uh, the second document that I'll quickly show you uh, consists of a structure, uh, and uh, I consider pro problems, the context, and the process, uh, or I'm sorry, performance, and then there's process advice as well. But the dimensions of the, the, uh, the context, um, the problems, the process and performance are dimensions for analyzing how organisms moved. Um, years ago, uh, Victor Vroom gave me an article by Richard Thaline on analyzing the group as an organism. And that led for, to me to derive four basic uh, dimensions of analysis. Uh, in an article with Michelle Gelfand, uh, we use those to examine how culture can be understood for, through the use of metaphors. And I use those uh, dimensions of analysis in my own work um, in many different ways. So, so you have um, for each dimension, uh, the problems, the context and performance, you have some examples of prompts that, that might be helpful. And we'll make those documents available to you. In fact, I'll, 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 I'll also make available to, to you the whole conversation I had uh, with uh, Chad GT. GPT-4 uh, to create uh, that advice. Um, I'd like to now go to the story of Motorola and quality. Um, and then I'll conclude with some um, specific advice uh, for um, getting uh, your enterprise AI ready. The story of Motorola and, and quality is a, a really interesting example uh, because what happened was um, Motorola would have these retreats. And this I'm learning from Pat Canavan. I just talked to Pat last week and just confirmed the details of the story, um, fact check myself, um, but, and Pat was there. So Motorola would do a, a corporate officer retreat every two years. And this was work. I mean, they would spend three or four hours in the morning working, and then they would go do activities in the afternoon like golfing, and they would bring their spouses and they would have dinner and they would be in a nice location uh, somewhere like Maui and the, it was it was a workcation, you know what I mean? They would um, they would enjoy themselves, but it was also a time for them to connect emotionally with each other. Well, there was a lunch that occurred, and during this lunch, um, a guy by the name of Art Sundry, who went on to become the head of their sales organization, uh, got up and made a passionate speech, and he was very aggressive. He was somewhat angry. Uh, Pat describes him as somebody who's very morally righteous. And he got up and basically chewed everybody out about the quality numbers. At that time, uh, in the, um, the uh, two-way radio business, Motorola had two mistakes for every 100 two-way two radios that it made. 
So Art got up and said, if, if we have a police department or a fire department that is using our radios and it doesn't work, people die. This is unacceptable. And Bob Galvin at that moment said, Art, you're absolutely right. Uh, we're gonna have a meeting when we get back. First thing, Monday or Tuesday, um, we're gonna meet and we're gonna tackle this issue. Thank you very much. Bob Galvin himself was a very righteous person and it makes sense that he would uh, choose and select other people who were righteous uh, to get promoted. And eventually Art went on to become the head of sales. There were many gasps and uh, sort of awkward, some awkwardness when Art got up that day, according to Pat and made his speech. But Bob Galvin's response, I think is noteworthy. He said, absolutely, you're right. Thank you for that comment. We're gonna take that up first thing Monday morning. So uh, what happened was, um, and here I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the, um, uh, to the AI, uh, result on quality improvement at Motorola. Here's the prompt. Uh, this will be available to you as well. And 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 what and what uh, Chat GPT does for us is it gives us some pretty good advice. I mean, I don't know. This is basically these are slides that Boston Consulting uh, would use if they were advising Bob Galvin in the 1980s. They did bring in experts. They brought in Deming. They brought in Duran. They brought in experts. They built Motorola University and everybody went through training on quality. They considered um, policies, long-term planning. They did all this. And what was remarkable to me about the story and why I think it's an important story for us, let's go back, um, is that um, Bob Galvin said to Jim Fields and I, when we met with him, he said, nothing worked. <laughs> he said, you can imagine my frustration uh, when we built Motorola University, we invented Six Sigma in my office, right? It was Bill Smith, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the chief engineer, um, Bill Wiggenhorn, uh, the head of training. They invented Six Sigma. They put everybody through Six Sigma from, from the top of the organization to the bottom of the organization. Everybody, it, administrative assistants, everybody went through Six Sigma and the numbers hardly changed. The, by the way, the numbers in this case are quality. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, the numbers in this case are customer satisfaction. Bob felt, <laughs> so, uh, Siri, please, not now. <laughs> Bob felt uh, that um, we have to measure customer satisfaction and anything we do, any investment we make should be reflected in customer satisfaction. Yes, they cared about the shareholders, but his top priority was always customer satisfaction. I think that's good advice for when we think about AI. Does all the stuff we're doing improve our customer satisfaction? If it doesn't, stop doing it and try something else. We have to keep customer satisfaction in mind and we have to measure it uh, in, in thoughtful ways, in new ways. We can't just ask two questions. We need 10 questions and we need um, interviews and we need to learn uh, what our customers are experiencing to make sure uh, that our changes in AI um, are reflected in customer satisfaction. That was, that was basically what, um, what Bob did. But the rest of the story, I think, is interesting. Um, he said, and it's a simple thing, he said, we didn't really see a dramatic improvement in our customer satisfaction numbers as a result of our quality initiatives until we did one thing. We required for every staff meeting at Motorola, the first item on the agenda is quality. And the last item on the agenda is quality. You can talk about everything you want to talk about in the middle about, you know, how, what are we doing to get that customer? What happened? Why did the wheels fall off over there? Uh, but you come back and you tie it all in to quality. So I would recommend that if you're, if you're leading change in your companies, you learn from the Motorola example. Everybody gets training. Everybody uses at, at least the um, large language models to find efficiency gains. Um, everybody um, has an agenda that says using AI at the top and using AI at the bottom. Other things that Motorola did, which we can use and I think comport to the problem of enterprise adoption with AI, they created tournaments. They created teams and they gave teams uh, the task of finding a quality pro uh, problem uh, and fix it in a way that's gonna affect customer satisfaction. And they would have competitions, they would present, um, and they would, the winners would then go on to the next round and eventually they would have the winning team 
Uh, they made the most contributions to our understanding about how to improve things uh, around quality. And they would be given a handsome uh, reward of some kind. Any reward, you got to understand who the people are, what they need, what they like, what they want. But they did some really cool things that I think uh, are easily comported to the challenge of uh, AI. Um, the future of leadership development uh, is the next topic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on through this kind of quickly so we can wrap up on time. Um, I think this is exciting. Uh, let me first off, let me let me first off state that I think my leader advisor AI bot will will be able to guard guide clients, and it will do ninety percent of what I do now. First of all, I'm dumping everything I know into it, uh, and then it has access to a lot more uh, information than I have instantly. Um, but there's there's some there's a ten percent that it can't do right now, and I, I I'm not going to show you this clip. It's in the it's in the slides. It's a clip from the movie Goodwill Hunting. In the movie Goodwill Hunting, you have this genius uh, janitor at MIT doing mathematics on the board, uh, and he goes and gets counseling from the late great um, Robin Williams character. And in their first meeting, uh, this young man is very disrespectful, and what Robin Williams does is surprising and um, really outside of the textbook answer of what a coach or a counselor should do. He gets up and he grabs the kid by the throat and says, if you ever disrespect my wife again, I will end you, chief. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great scene. But there's something there uh, that, at least to my mind, helps me understand uh, the role of authentic um, emotion and uh, surprise. In a um, in a coaching process, and I think um, you still need uh, you still need us. <laughs> Let me though continue with some new directions. Uh, in a in in a collaboration with Reza Piri, I'm making this um, leader um, leader advisor bot, and um, it's not ready yet. I, I was hoping it would be, but it's not. That's the new direction. In fact, um, I would say. Um, I have uh, some of uh, my, my partners in mind, but every executive coach should make themselves a bot. And um, I'll, lay, I'll lay out the gauntlet right now. I challenge you um, in a company, you set my bot loose and set your bot loose, my bot will uh, improve customer satisfaction more than yours. <laughs> Let's compete. We can do science. For the first time, it becomes very easy to demonstrate uh, the efficacy of what we do and uh, this is really important because I know, and um, I know if Bob Turknet meets with a client, he will change how that person leads. He will change how they look at themselves, how they look at their role. Uh, it will be a dramatic improvement. And I think um, all, of, all of my uh, consulting and coaching friends, I would say the same thing. So um, there, 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 there will be bots. I think also um, there's something I call the A plus B equals C factor. This is synergy. There's additive, you know, your work plus my work equals your work plus my work and it adds up and we get things done as a group, but there's sometimes magic. There's, there's value added be beyond, above and beyond the mere addition of what we bring to the table. And that magic happens uh, when we have, uh, this is also something that Victor Vroom has taught and I'm relying on him here. When we create common goals, we have uh, differences, we're able to make and resolve conflict um, we're able to discuss things without the hierarchy getting in the way. You know, we all want to look good in front of the boss. And so we're going to agree with whatever the boss says. <laughs> you know, when we get past all of that stuff, we can actually create a situation where the sum is greater than the parts. I think that's a new direction in leadership development. The, the set of skills that help us do that. Assessments, um, you know, you could do that on your own. And I would expect um, in our first meeting, um, I would get to know you and talk about your life and your career. This is what I learned from Bob and Lynn Turknet. And then we would do a bunch of assessments. That's great. But I think what becomes more important, particularly when we think about synergy skills, is the multi-source or 360 feedback. What's also, I think, going to become more important is the holistic focus. Um, a, an, a, a leadership advisor, an executive coach, uh, should have more of a holistic approach. We do have the time now. And, and um, we can capitalize on the efficiency gains from using AI to have a more holistic approach. Uh, Bob and Lynn 
Turknet have sons, uh, Josh and Rob, who are experts uh, in, uh, one is a medical doctor, the other is an expert on IT. I don't know if they um, had, a, had a vision for that, uh, but both of their sons are, are needed more now uh, for leadership development than ever. Um, I think physical well-being and medical doctors are very important for leadership development and will become more so in the future. Spiritual health, um, you know, having in some way your spiritual side cultivated, your soul, if you will, um, your ability to inspire and connect with others uh, can be improved if you're, if you're more balanced uh, spiritually, I would contend. But perhaps the biggest cha change in my view will be co-creating leadership development experiences. Um, I'm someone who has always done um, off the beaten path experiences. So while I have been an academic um, for over the course of many decades, I've worked as a painter, painting apartments um, all over the city of Chicago uh, with my brother-in-law, shout out to Azure Realm and my, my painter friends. Um, I've worked as a butcher in Chicago. In fact, I'm, I'm still a member of the local 181 Meat Cutters uh, Union. <laughs> um, I've done everything else in a grocery store. Um, I've um, worked as a security guard, which is interesting uh, these days if you're dressed like a police officer to walk around in society in the United States. Um, I've done, I've worked as a cook, I've worked as a server, I've worked as a restaurant manager. I had a hot dog cart on Bourbon Street. So when I think about all of my experience, and then of course in academics, I've been to great universities all over the world. I've met the most amazing people. My students are inspiring beyond uh, words. You know, so I've had experiences which have shaped the way I see things. And I think that's part of the logic of the future of leadership development. Many times we've done activities, um, Pat Canavan and I and Fernando Monteroso and I used to do French Quarter scavenger hunts in New Orleans with our executive groups. Um, I had uh, uh, professional MBA students from Houston travel to Guatemala and get hosted by a group of Guatemalans. If you've never been hosted by Guatemalans, um, I highly recommend it. Uh, they're probably in the top five um, cultural patterns when it comes to really hosting people. And so when my uh, students went to Guatemala and we came back and talked about it, they said the, the Guatemalans were amazing. What they did for us, how they made us feel, it was unbelievable. Then it occurred to them that the Guatemalans are coming back to um, Houston. And they said, oh my gosh, we need to get ready. What are we gonna do? And they just went off and they became the, the greatest hosts ever. Um, experiences, uh, experience is probably the best teacher if it's managed and done in, in a structured way. Um, we took a class at Tulane uh, to Venice and we uh, created the amazing scavenger race. And I've never seen a class on the train ride back from Venice to Bologna. I've never seen a class so engaged. I mean, basically they took over a car on the train and this is Europe and it's beautiful. Nobody's looking out the window. I'm saying, did you guys see that? Nobody cares. They are talking to each other emotionally charged, talking about what they did, how they found that, how they did that. And they were doing things that develop skills that I would say are needed for an A plus B equals C synergistic um, process. Victor Vroom and I once did an executive program in Zacatecas, Mexico. And um, we, we had a donkey. It had two big jugs of tequila on either side. And there was a mariachi band and as we walked through the streets of Zacatecas, the donkey would stop and we would, everybody would take a shot at tequila and the mariachi band be, sounded better and better. As we walked through the streets, we had a wonderful time. And when, when, the, when the participants left that program, uh, I've never had an experience where everybody in the program wants to give Victor and, and, and me a hug. I mean, they had such a great time. And it really, in my view, sprang from uh, that activity that helped, helped us bond helped us create that emotional connection, that rapport uh, that led to mutual cooperation and, and synergy. Or come on to Maui, uh, we can attend a Ram Das uh, spiritual healing event and um, we can learn about uh, balancing ourselves emotionally and uh, go snorkeling or other activities. Um, I think it's very important to uh, consider the future of leadership development. 
uh, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, here's, I'm gonna conclude with just, uh, I know we're gonna conclude here in about three minutes, Dan. Here are some, uh, some advice. I, di I, I recommend diving right in and um, make, making sure everybody has access to a, a large language mo model and uses it to find a, an efficiency gain. The, the surplus from those efficiency gains is reinvested in teams, uh, AI learning teams that compete uh, for ideas and how to apply AI uh, to improve customer satisfaction. I think we wanna measure everything immediately much better than we do now. Your, the quantity and quality of data, the integrity of data has become extremely important. I think uh, leaders should rule by, lead by example. Don't pretend you know everything um, uh, and uh, nobody else will either. And that humility, I think situates us to learn uh, even more and have fun. The last thing I'll mention is um, at some point there's a singularity. At some point, uh, the AI systems are far more intelligent than us. Uh, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because of what we're doing now and what we will continue to do is train our future silicon-based leaders. And if they base their leadership on my leader advisor bot, don't worry about anything. <laughs> Let me, uh, okay, that's, that's hopefully a joke. <laughs> Let me uh, conclude there. Uh, let me thank everybody very much. Um, it's been really fun. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have to end. I'm gonna hand it over to to Dan to wrap up. I'm gonna stick around um, if anybody wants to hang out and talk. Um, I think we can do another 15 minutes, but we have to stop the recording now. Thank you very much, everybody.